All right. Hello. Good. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us in today's live session on uh, race lighting. And we are, are very, very excited to be able to offer this this new online program uh, that focuses on race lighting in schools, colleges and universities. Next slide. And I think most of us know that uh, today is the second of three live sessions that we have planned to support the launch of this professional learning program. Uh, for those of you who joined us last week, thank you so much for returning. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time this week, we're happy and excited to have you with us. And I hope that you'll make the decision to join us again next week. Um, and while we know that there's a lot of love and support for uh, me and Dr. Wood, most of you are actually joining us to hear from our distinguished guests. Dr. William A. Smith, who's a professor of education and culture and society at the University of Utah, also holds an executive administrative position with the Huntsman Mental Health Institute. Um, and he's gonna be sharing some of his groundbreaking research on racial battle fatigue and its connection to race lighting. And of course, Luke and I are very, very excited that he is able to join us and be with us today. Next slide. So the uh, the professional learning program, those of you who've ever done one of the programs that Luke and I have designed, you understand and know that it's uh, we typically offer them in, in uh, four to five parts. Uh, it's primarily asynchronous, it's all online, and each program has a set of uh, objectives. And so the race lighting program has four objectives. Um, and so you'll be able to, to define race lighting and distinguish active uh, and passive race lighting, which are you know the pr two primary types of race lighting. Uh, you'll be able to circulate the relationship between race lighting and the most common racial microaggressions that are experienced by uh, Black and Indigenous people of color in academic contexts. Third, you'll be able to describe how race lighting leads to a host of unhealthy and undesirable outcomes for Black and Indigenous people of color, notably a dis diminished sense of belonging and self-worth, uh, lower academic and career outcomes, and something that we'll talk quite a bit about today, the acute effects of racial battle fatigue. And then uh, finally, we'll offer strategies that can be enacted personally and institutionally to address and mitigate the effects of race lighting. And so again, those objectives are for the entire online program, not specifically for this live session. Um, and so we hope that this live session will um, entice or motivate everyone to go ahead and, and sign up and take the, uh, the online program. Next slide. Also with regard to the online program, I uh, wanna remind everyone that this program is being offered completely free to any colleague or student who wishes to participate. Thanks in all part to the College Futures Foundation who provided grant funding for Luke and I to develop and to be able to offer this program. Uh, there's also an opportunity to earn continuing education units for those who are interested. We'll share more information about that at the end of today's session. And so if that's something you're interested in, we would hope that you would um, certainly uh, stay on and stay tuned for that. And then we want to give a big special shout out to uh, Sean Whalen, who's our program officer uh, and thought partner, more than just a program officer, thought partner with the College Futures Foundation and providing guidance and support for this. And then uh, finally, before I turn it over to Luke, we want to thank uh, some of our, our, our organizations and colleagues that are sponsoring this webinar, uh, Diverse Issues in Higher Education has always been, you know, just offered tremendous support for the work that we've done. Uh, our home system, the California uh, State University System, the Education Trust West, and uh, of course, the California Community College Chancellor's Office. And just wanna thank um, all of the colleagues who are involved in these organizations for their collaboration, for their support, and really helping us and get the word out to colleagues about this exciting learning opportunity. Uh, that being said, I actually did this last week. I forgot to introduce myself. So I'm gonna introduce myself again. I'm gonna go to turn it over to Luke, but uh, I am Frank Harris III, and I have the distinct honor and pleasure of serving as a professor of post-secondary education at San Diego State. Uh, also serve as associate dean for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the College of Education at San Diego State. And um, with Dr. Wood, I am one of the co-directors of the Community College Equity Assessment Lab, which is a research and practice lab that we developed uh, well over a decade ago to facilitate partnership with community colleges and efforts to institutionalize equity. So with that, thank you all so much. I'm going to turn it over to Luke and look forward to the uh, dialogue that we'll have today. Thank you. 
Thank you, Frank. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, we just want to remind folks that um, as part of this program, uh, there is uh, a free CEU version of it that's being offered uh, through Quora. So if you go to coralearning.org and you click on programs and go to race lighting, uh, there are, uh, it's a 20 uh, hour program, which equivalent is uh, two CEUs that's awarded for anybody who uh, completes the program for free. So it's really just meant to be a service. So we hope you'll do it. We hope you'll bring it to your respective institutions and encourage others to do it and see this as a, a nice uh, professional learning opportunity that's offered again by College Futures Foundation and, and being authored for free CEUs through Quora. Uh, in addition to that, we also mentioned last time that there's a, a website, a kind of landing site, if you want to learn more just about race lighting in general, it's racelighting.net. You can go there to get an overview of race lighting, see some of the different works that have been done. Uh, in fact, there was a publication that came out yesterday in the Community College Journal Research and Practice that uh, Frank and I did on, on addressing race lighting, and we'll, we'll make sure that that's posted there. Um, definitions, videos, and other resources, including the race lighting lesson plan that can be used at uh, uh, for various different contexts, but essentially it's a lesson plan that we develop that uh, gives an overview of race lighting and then has a, an actual story of two individuals, Jacob and Jazz, and essentially you, um, you go through different parts of the story, you stop the video, and then there's guiding questions that help you make sense of how uh, Jacob is experiencing race lighting. Um, and this is all based upon research that's been done um, by myself, my colleague Frank, uh, Idara Essien, and also uh, Dr. Tina King as well. And so it's just an awesome resource. So we hope you'll check that out. So in terms of today's conversation, last time we talked about the antecedents of race lighting. We looked a little bit at white nationalism, white supremacy. We noted that there's two different types of bias, explicit bias and implicit bias, explicit being overt and implicit being kind of covert and beneath the surface. And that both of those types of bias influence the ways in which we communicate and engage one another through a concept called microaggressions. And microaggressions, as we mentioned, is a concept that was created by a, psych a psychiatrist, Chester Pierce from Harvard Medical School, uh, who looked at the ways in which uh, subtle, mundane, everyday racism served to impact the lives and experiences of Black people, particularly looking at it through a lens of dignity and how uh, these experiences serve to create a sense of uh, in action, the ability to uh, or inhibit a, a person's feeling of the ability to be able to change um, and act um, in response to racism. And since then, a scholar named Daryl Wing Su, as well as many others, have, have created different frameworks of ways of, of thinking about uh, these different types of microaggressions. There are micro assaults, which is kind of like good old fashioned racism and very similar to explicit bias. And then more related to implicit bias are micro insults and micro invalidations, where we invalidate. Uh, the experiences, uh, the lives, the dignity of people of color, or we um, insult them. And so we're going to be looking at essentially how those messages then relate to race lighting. And as we mentioned before, race lighting in, in its most simple form is what happens when gaslighting is racial. And there are different um, ways in which race lighting differs from gaslighting. Most central to it is that race and racism are central to uh, the messages that are being communicated to make someone second guess, their, second guess their lived experiences, their realities, their knowledge, their capabilities, and even um, their basic humanity. And we mentioned last time that if you ever get to a point where you're saying to yourself, maybe I'm not as smart as I thought it was, maybe I'm not as good as I thought it was, maybe I don't belong here, that doubt, that disorientation, that sense of an overwhelming sense that we are becoming delusional, it's not us, it could be race lighting. And we also know, and we've talked about this before, that we see race lighting as serving in many ways where microaggression serves as a, as a kind of window into race lighting. We see that race lighting really uh, serves into a, as a window into what we would argue are probably even more important concept, chief among them being racial battle fatigue, which we'll get to in a moment. But when we think about microaggressions, well, one of the things that we want to think about is a term called attributional ambiguity. Attributional ambiguity is when you have this sense of haziness or lack of clarity about what's being said to you. So when someone says to you, oh, wow, you're so articulate. I didn't expect you to know that. Or walks up to a student and asks them for their ID, right? There's the message that's being communicated to them that may be difficult to place. It may be hazy. It may be unclear. There may be a lack of clarity. 
And that lack of clarity is attributional ambiguity. And we see that serving as the doorway into race lighting, where the message, because it's hard to place, is one that then makes someone begin to second guess themselves, their lived experiences, their realities, their knowledge, their capabilities, their decision making, as I mentioned, their basic humanity. And last time that we were together, we mentioned that there are four different types of of, of race lighting messages. And it's not that these are the only four, these are just four that we ha have uh, spent time talking about. We wanted to just give a quick overview of one of them, and that is resistive actions. And resistive actions is a type of, of, of message that is oftentimes used to race light Black, Indigenous, and people of color um, to make them uh, essentially actions that are meant to defend the perpetrator against personal racism or one's own role in racism. And so there's different ways in which we see these messages playing out. One is through denial of individual racism or denial of racism, which is a also a, a common microaggression. And this is when someone says, can be a situation where someone says something, uh, let's say that they use a racial epitaph and then you bring that to their attention and their immediate response is to deny that that's what occurred that what you heard, that what you've experienced, that what you've endured is not what actually took place. They might say, what I said wasn't racist, or that's not cultural appropriation. I'm trying to honor their culture, or that's not what you heard. That's not what I said. Uh, we didn't make that change for that reason. If you're suggesting that a change was made to inhibit progress for people of color. And ultimately these messages matter because they can make someone on the other end start to second guess themselves, that the, that the things that they are hearing are wrong, that they're not interpreting or interpreting what someone is saying correctly, that they're being overly sensitive, or that they're even losing their own grip on reality. Another example of resistive actions is what is called reverse causality. Reverse causality refers to assuming a person of color is the locus of a problem. One example that we oftentimes provide of this is a young child who is, let's say, in kindergarten, and the teacher has told the children, if someone uh, pushes you, if someone says something negative you, to you, don't push back, don't say anything back, come and talk to me, come and talk to the teacher. So let's say that we have a young black boy who's in kindergarten, and there's a num number, another child of a different background who pushes him. Now, he doesn't push back. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't do anything wrong. He does exactly what he's been asked to do. He goes to the teacher and he says to the teacher that this is what occurred to him. And the teacher, what we find, rather than getting on eye level and having a conversation or consoling the student, oftentimes might say to him, well, what is it that you did to cause this to occur? Essentially reversing the causality or, the, or assuming that he is the locus of control or the locus of the problem. We also see victim blaming occur uh, when individuals have been wronged in particular situations and blame for what has occurred. In, in some cases, the harm uh, the victim has experienced may even be perceived as being de deserved. So victim blaming is an unfortunate yet common response to police involved killings of black people. For example, names such as George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Alfred Alongo, Tamir Rice, Michael Brown, served as, as act, apt examples of many individuals who have lost their lives to those who have been sworn to protect them. Too often, when an unarmed person is shot and killed by police, a frequent response from media and law enforcement is to suggest that the individual deserved their demise, saying that the suspect had a weapon, had drugs in their system, posed an imminent threat, or had a criminal record. Information often will be released later indicating that none of these factors were present or that the official story is being significantly overblown. With respect to being overblown, someone may be reported as having drugs in their system, but a toxicology report may later indicate that there was only a trace amount in their system. In, the, in each case where factors are present, let's say that there is some sort of thing that the person had, Black people are responded to differently and more extremely in addition to other people of color um, by law enforcement officers. Often, if all factors were the same, a person from a majority group, such as a white individual, would be treated differently and not engaged with lethal force. And that is an example of how reverse causality can serve to send these messages. Claims of reverse racism um, are also examples of messages that can serve to race light Black, Indigenous, and people of color. 
And this refers to advancing the notion that the majority groups are those that are being oppressed. You may hear statements such as, this is part of cancel culture, or you're the one that's being racist by bringing up conversations on race and racism. Or that, uh, or that conversation such as the one that's taken place, the national conversation on critical race theory is one that, uh, that people are pushing back on critical race theory because it makes students feel bad, or it somehow uh, forces a, a, a conversation that promotes racism when really it's a conversation that's meant to uh, counteract and, and destruct racism. Another example is what are called public declarations of incompetence. And this are these refer to declaring a lack of understanding or knowledge to immunize oneself from being racist. Um, and this is, uh, of course, from uh, our colleague Sean Harper. Public declarations of incompetence are important. It's, it's essentially when someone says, I don't know what you want me to do in this particular situation. I'm not prepared to do so. I have not been educated to do so. I did not know what that word or phrase meant when I used it. You said it means this. In my community, it means that or I grew up in a place that didn't have a lot of people of color, so I'm not really sure how you want me to support them. And what we've oftentimes pointed to is this, is that when someone makes these public declarations of incompetence when it comes to issues of race and racism, they fly in the face of what it means to be in academia. Because we as educators oftentimes will encourage our students to learn all sorts of new ideas, to challenge themselves with new formulas and simulations, and to push themselves to learn more within that zone of proximal development. Yet at the same time, turn around, and when it comes to issues of race and racism, throw our hands up and say that we don't have the capacity to learn, to grow, to develop, to become better, and be more effective in the work that we do. And so those are just some framing comments that we wanted to share uh, at the outset of this um, as we move into um, this conversation with, uh, again, our colleague and friend, Dr. William Smith, uh, who's from the University of Utah. And so I'm going to introduce Dr. Smith uh, real quickly here, and then we'll get going into having an opportunity to hear from him, as well as having some uh, questions um, and answers uh, throughout the rest of this session. So I'll read his formal bio and then I'll tell you um, even more kind of a, a personal perspective here. So Dr. William A. Smith is the Chief Executive Administrator in the Huntsman Mental Health Institute in the School of Medicine and the Department of Psychiatry. In this position, one of Dr. Smith's responsibilities is to lead its efforts around justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion at the institutional level and in national projects. He is also a former professor and Department Chair of Education, Culture, and Society at the University of Utah. Additionally, he holds a joint appointment in the Ethnic Studies Program, African American Studies Division, as a full professor. Dr. Smith has served as the Associate Dean of Diversity, Access, and Equity in the College of Education, and as a Special Assistant to the President as the NCAA Faculty Athletics Representative at the University of Utah. Dr. Smith is an internationally known scholar who has often sought out for keynote presentations and interviews. In the past two years alone, he has provided almost 100 keynote lectures, presentations, and interviews from South Africa to Australia to Fortune 500 companies around the United States. Dr. Smith's research focuses on his theoretical and scholarly contribution of racial battle fatigue, a concept he coined in 2003 regarding the, cum the cumulative, emotional, psychological, physiological and behavioral effects of racial level microaggressions and racial macro level aggressions, microaggressions and macroaggressions have on racialized targets of white supremacy. He summarizes this definition by saying that it is a systemic race related repetitive stress injury. Dr. Smith received his undergraduate master's degree from Eastern Illinois University in psychology and counseling psychology and his PhD from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in educational policy studies, soci sociology, social psychology of higher education. Now, I would say that beyond the that uh, professional uh, introduction that I just read there for you of his biography, that he is one of the most profound and important scholars in all of psychology. I would say that today we are blessed to have one of the most consequential psychologists in the nation. 
William A. Smith is the scholar who coined the term racial battle fatigue, giving us language to describe how racism crushes us emotionally, cog cognitively, and physically. Dr. Smith's name sits among the most influential psychologists in history, alongside Freud, Skinner, Bandura, Pavlov, and Vygotsky as a giant among giants for the contributions that he has had that are the most relevant to our time. So with that, I'd like to turn it over and welcome Dr. William A. Smith. Well, thank you, Luke. <laughs> I hope I can live up to that, uh, <laughs> that personal introduction. Now, uh, can you see me? Because I can't see myself on the screen. Yes, we can see you and we can hear you clearly as well. Good, good, good. To have good. You. So, I'm, I'm really fortunate to be in, in your presence and Dr. Harris's presence and all the good that you're doing with um, this program and the, um, you know, just the information that you're providing um, thousands of people, I guess, over 1.4 thousand uh, people. So that's impressive. Appreciate that. Thank you. So yeah, we want to make sure that we get the word out to the people and uh, on and provide them with language that helps them to understand what they're what they're going through. So with that in mind, uh, would you be the, get willing to kind of give an overview of what is racial battle fatigue and why it's been so consequential to the research that you've done uh, for so many years now? Well, in the definition that you read, it kind of sums it up. It's a uh, systemic. Racism-related repetitive stress injury. So, some people liken it to PTSD, which is uh, an erroneous connection. Yes, they have similarities, but you can have a traumatic event, and then you're removed from where the trauma occurred, the traumatic event occurred, and you could be restored. You could be put back into health. You could have people affirm your reality. And you can seek healing, you know, healing. However, what does that look like for um, African Americans, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders who are here in the United States? When you suffer at the hands of racism, institutional and everyday racism, from the womb to the tomb. So this helps to explain the kind of health consequences of the ongoing systemic levels of racism that penetrate not only our body, but our, our mind. And what we have to understand too is that racism and the effects are traumatic. Tra trauma is what happens to the body. Traumatic events is what happened to you. So you could be hit by a car as I was when I was in uh, fifth grade right? That was a traumatic event. The trauma stayed in my body. So when a car was, was screeching its brakes, its tires, you know, I would, you know, get in shock, you know, that would be a trigger for me. Similarly, that happens to many people that look like us who suffer at the hands of racism. So what we have to do is find ways, uh, and I'm challenging this uh, resilience kind of uh, um, notion because many of us are, are survivors resilience puts us back to where we were before the injury occurred right and if you um looked at Car clarissa shields that that young sister who has a a mighty strong right and left hook she can hit you so hard that snot comes out your ears <laughs> you know now if you get through around with her, you might just survive, but you're punch drunk, right? You're not resilient, you're surviving. You need to be like you were in the condition before you stepped into the ring. And that's what we're struggling with. I love I love that example for so many reasons. One, I love boxing and, and Clarissa Shields is one of my favorite boxers. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's a really good uh, description of, um, of how the of the difference between being a survivor versus being resilient, and I think that that's a that's a point that I, that I I haven't heard before, but it's so powerful. So I, I really appreciate you you sharing that. Uh, so in, in terms of, of racial battle fatigue, 
like, what brought you, to, like, what, how did you get to the point where you recognize that this was something that was taking place? Was it, um, was it based upon research? Was it based upon experience that then led to you doing more research? Was it based upon amalgamating different things that you were seeing in different areas and kind of trying to make sense of it? How, how did you get to that point? Well, I think it really started when I was at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So it was the precursor to my study on racial battle fatigue. So what I was learning there built up to uh, my contributions towards racial battle fatigue. I didn't realize what it was at the time. We have to understand that trauma theory is relatively new. Uh, trauma theory really just started in the 80s. Um, um, polyvagal theory in the 90s racial battle fatigue in the early 2000s. So we understood that there were things like shell shock and um, trauma that was um, uh, performed on women in surgeries to say that there was uh, hysteria. So they would remove you know, their wounds, but we really didn't have understanding of what it really did um, to people based upon society. Um, we didn't really get the biopsychosocial model until 1977. So that show that tells you that, you know, all of this understanding is relatively new. So when I was working on some data, I was trying to engage it more like a scholar, a scientist, and separate myself from it. But the more I was reading, especially these um, qualitative interviews, I started to see myself in the data. Right. And then I had to take a pause and say, you know, what they're saying is what I'm feeling. And I had to really connect that to this biopsychosocial model. And so that's what I did uh, the first year. So actually next year at AARA in Chicago will be the 20th kind of celebration of racial battle fatigue because I presented wow. it in 2003 at AARA in Chicago. Wow, that's full circle. Yeah, full circle, 20 years apart. And, and look where we've come. Yeah, we, well, I would say that um, in that time frame, it has, I, so, um, you know, I have the privilege of, of talking to a number of different audiences as part of the work that, you know, Frank and I do. And it used to be that I would ask folks uh, at the beginning of a session, like, who here has heard of the term racial battle fatigue? And I get one or two people who raise their hand, and I'll say that that pattern has changed. I see uh, far more um, wider knowledge of, of of what racial battle fatigue is, even if it's at a cursory level. There's still more of an, an of an awareness, and so to think about the level of impact that you've had in in getting that concept to people in a way that empowers them to address the issues that they're facing, I think it's 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 definitely worth worth noting. So we have a, a question that just came in and it says, what actions can institutions of higher education take to create campus climates and cultures that minimize racial battle fatigue? It has, the campus has to first understand that it exists. Most people who are in leadership positions are have benign neglect on the experiences of what I call Peach years. And peach years are persons currently and historically excluded because of their ethnicity or race, right? So these type of non-dominant group members are having an experience that many of the institutional leaders are clueless to and really have no interest in understanding fully and don't empower sometimes their chief diversity officers to really make a difference. So they have to come to grips with that because if they don't, what tends to happen, students will let you know and they'll, they'll lead demonstrations and show you what they're feeling. So one of the things is to be uh, intentional. Yes, we have a problem, just like every other institution in the United States. And we want to be one that's on the front line trying to eliminate all forms of oppression, transphobia, uh, 
anti-LGBTQ+, uh, sexism, neurodiversity, you name it. They have to be leaders just like they're leaders in science and medicine and law. Mm. So, so camp, campuses probably do struggle, right, to, to address these issues. Yeah. Here's one of the things that I'm wondering, and it's just a thought that I've, that I've had for a while. A lot of campuses will do assessments of campus climate, right? And they'll say, and they'll get an indication of what that climate looks like in general. But how many of them actually go to the point of actually assessing the harm that's being done by that climate? And I think that this prob those are probably two very different things, right? Right. Yeah. And I think what they're probably scared of is a lawsuit. Because <laughs> <laughs> if, if you admit and you know that your, your institution is causing harm and you didn't do anything about it, that's problematic. But we have numerous studies from the Michigan study over 20, 30 years ago, all the way through the work that you and Dr. Harris have been doing on community colleges. Um, Ebenezer Zamadian Community College, um, you mentioned um, many other scholars. Um, um, and we, we really, if we have the evidence, if we have all the knowledge, Sean Harper is who I was trying to think about, Sean Harper's work. So we have all the information. Why don't we do something? Right? Again, we have to be intentional to, to make a change. We, we have to desire change and it can't be on the backs of people uh, to do the changing who are the ones that's always harmed. That means that we have to um, recruit. When we go after professors, we have to recruit those who have a critical consciousness where mm -hmm. they understand and they already have a resume of work, right? We, we scrutinize um, um, non-dominant group members. What SIGs do you belong to? Um, where were you trained? Who were you with? Uh, are you black enough? Are you brown enough? And we let white folks off the hook, right? Mm. We have to scrutinize their CV just like we scrutinize everybody else's. What SIGs do you belong to, right? Show us the, the track record of support, not just in your articles, but in your daily lives, what organizations do you belong to? That will change the culture. And I often use this quote that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Mm -hmm. So culture eats strategy for breakfast. That means that you can't just come in with a different strategy to change an institution. You have to change the culture. If it's anti-Black or anti-woman or anti-trans, that culture is there and strategy tends not to work. Change the culture. Mm. So there's lots of people who are writing in just um, expressing that, that you're giving language to, to what they personally experience and they're providing a lot of personal examples here ranging from challenges at work to even having a negative health diagnoses as well. And uh, so it's very... Uh, very emotional. So there, but a lot of folks are asking a very similar question, which is like, how do I get help for, for this? What do I do to protect myself? And they're asking that. So Frank, if, if you can respond to that afterwards uh, related to uh, race lighting, but really I think the, the focus here is on racial battle fatigue. What, what can they do? Yeah. Well, one of the things that is very helpful is to have um, support, group support a network that you can rely on. It could be at the institutions that you're, you're in or externally to them, but you have to have a small group of people who have your back and who understands that you don't have to explain your reality and, and hope that someone will affirm it. That's one of the biggest dangers for people like us who have experienced some of these things and then we share it and then people race like us. Oh, is it real? Are you just being hypersensitive? Uh, you should, um, shouldn't be a snowflake. What are you talking about? <laughs> this, what we have to understand is racism is an act 
of violence. Mm -hmm. The body codes racism as a violent act. So if we understand that and we know that there's a link between that violent act and our lifespan being shortened, then we'll take it a little bit more seriously. So um, reach out to your social support networks, exercise, start to eat right, start to meditate, start to find other avenues. Do not bring this uh, traumatic experiences home. Let your house be a place of where you can have reprieve, where you could calm down, you can relax, you can have positivity in the house. Right, leave yeah. that that drama outside. So those are some of the ways in which we can personally take care of ourselves. Mm. And I have to say that um, I heard you. Uh, well, I've heard you a, f- a number of times speak about racial bias fatigue. I learn something new every time, which is which uh, so so powerful about it. But um, one of the things I remember you talking about was the the symptoms, particularly like the physiological symptoms and psychological symptoms, right? So anger, anger suppression, resentment, inability to be able to sleep, upset, upset stomach, headaches, tension, aches, backache, elevated heartbeat. And I was just like, as you were going through this, I know that like I was thinking about the people who I work with who are, you know, advocates for, for racial justice, who are going through all these things because we have conversations around it. I was thinking about even myself personally. And one of the things you, I mean, you use the example of Clarissa Shields. Like one of the things that I started doing in response to what to hearing you describe what you just did right there was I started picking up boxing. And so now, right, I box every single day. Um, I even compete uh, here and there as well. And I think that for me, it's been one of the most important uh, strategies to combat racial battle fatigue for myself, at least, because especially particularly anger, anger, suppression, resentment getting that out and expelling that so that I can be focused when I'm at work and not uh, feel like I'm losing myself in some way. Uh, I think particularly for people who do diversity, equity, inclusion work as a part of life, as a part of what they do professionally, I think that there's there's a lot that they can take from the recommendations that you just gave there. Yeah, and and I would be so forward to say that I I think that probably was a lifesaver for you. You know, the picking up boxing. Oh, and yeah. Not only for you personally, but probably for you as a father and as a, a spouse. Right. So if you think about it, if we're dealing with all of this um, traumatic experiences of racism on the job, especially trying to carry all this weight, many people carry that home. Yeah. You found a source um, of relief. So you can punch a bag instead of a person at work. (laughs) (laughs) Because we've all been there. Yeah. We've all been in that spot that you just say, I wish I the wood, right? Yeah. Don't try me. Not today, right? And so those positive outlets are what we need. And what if we look at especially the black community, we have to look at it for. Uh, as a, um, a study of genocide and anti-Blackness. Look at the food that's all in our community. Fast food restaurants poisoning us. Um, in Chicago, currency exchanges instead of banks because they know that you're not, they don't want you to invest. They just want you to take pay a fee and get some money, a little bit of money back. So all of these things are really working together, hand in glove around racial battle fatigue to make us have those symptoms. But the other thing that you mentioned with anger suppression and all these other things, did you know that um, for people who are very nice, who who try to do good for folks um, and, and, and try to take things like your problems as their problems, many of them who have ALS have those same type of characteristics. Really? Yeah. Did you know that there's a high correlation for women, Black women like that, who become super women, uh, super woman, um, anger suppression. I'm going to carry all the weight on my shoulders. There's a high correlation with breast cancer. Mm. So we have to start watching what we do and how the 
societal, institutional consequences of our behaviors and actions and what we allow to um, happen leads to racism, institutional systemic racism that causes health consequences like ALS and breast cancer, adult onset of asthma in black women from day to day racism. You Why know, are all these black women getting asthma? It's grown women. You, you, um, you were here at San Diego State uh, very, very recently, and you shared a study that I that I found thought was just absolutely profound. Um, and it was really it was about racial battle fatigue, but then it dealt with memory loss. Do you is that can you talk about that just a little bit? Yeah, it was a study of approximately sixty thousand black women, and in these um, in this study. They were looking at forms of daily racism and institutionalized racism. What they found was that Black women who experienced daily racism were roughly 2.6 times at risk for lower subjective cognitive functioning, memory loss, Alzheimer's, dementia. Those Black women who experienced institutionalized racism were almost 2.7 times more likely at, to be at risk for lower subjective cognitive functioning. So this, finally, we're having researchers who are putting the biopsychosocial aspects to stress and racism together to give us a clearer picture of what is happening to us. And at the very bottom of that picture are Black people then Latina and Latino brothers, Latinx brothers and sisters, and them and theys, right? So we have to be very, very careful. We have to be on guard. And that's the other unfortunate thing. Being on guard can also lead to stress. Mm. And stress leads to health consequences. Wow. That, that's powerful. The... Um... There's a, a few questions in here that that talk about like the, the given like how how profound and it, there's lots of messages just coming in is just reaffirming the the importance of the work that you're you've been doing. There there but what people are asking is like everybody should know this. How soon can we can we teach people? There's a question here about middle school. There's a question about elementary school. There's a question about should this be part of the college curriculum? Like at what point do you think? And I know that that kind of tiptoes into the argument a little bit about CRT, which I'm not necessarily asking you to talk about, but just in terms of racial battle fatigue, when is that something that you think should be taught to people? Because I would assume that awareness can empower someone to make very important changes in their life. It should be preached in every sermon or, or, or many sermons from every pulpit. And I did see a couple of publications from on racial battle fatigue and the church. But oh. pastors should be um, talking about this. Priests should be talking about this. Community-based organizations, um, parental education should be talking about this because it starts so young that our children are under attack. There was a study done on um, brilliance in, in among, I think, five-year-olds and six-year-olds in school. Who holds brilliance or in, in child? vernacular, who's was really, really smart. And it was white girls, white boys, um, Latino boys, Latina girls, Asian boys and girls, and black girls and black boys. And they asked about white women, white men, black women, black men. All of these children responded the same. And it's going to confuse you. If I said who were the first one, you would all agree and they would be right. They said white men were the most brilliant or the really, really smart. The second place would throw you off. Second place among all of these children were white women and black women, right? Last place or the least really, really smart were black men. So what does this mean for the black girl and black boy in those classrooms who both see black men as the least intelligent and the teacher potentially 
seeing the black kids or black boy as lacking intelligence, lacking smartness. This gives us answers to class um, culture. This gives us to uh, uh, attention to the school to prison pipeline, low teacher expectation, right? So class um, climate, low teacher expectation, why black boys are ending up in special ed over everybody else, why we're not seeing them graduate and go on to college, right? So these, this gives us answers that it starts so young. Yeah, I, kn I know that it starts young because I know that um, that with the study that I've been involved with, with Idara, my wife, right? We look at black children in preschool through third grade and we look at their experiences with, with microaggressions. And so the focus of the study is on microaggressions, but once you start looking at microaggressions, you know that you're gonna hear things about how it impacts uh, young children. And we hear very direct examples about how it affects their attentional focus in the classroom, right? Because if you're in an environment that is where you're experiencing this, you know, that's not a, a, a safe or welcoming environment. But one of the examples that I often give because it's one that I see so frequently is the, the young boy who's being picked on and, and bullied at school. Um, and it's like an, in a very racialized way and it has an educator or a teacher who's not supporting him. He goes home, he wakes up in the morning and says, I don't wanna go to school. And the parent's like, well, why don't you wanna go to school? They're, they're, they're trying to understand, they're trying to rush to get out of the house in the morning. And he doesn't have the language yet to say, well, I don't feel a sense of belonging in school. And so I'd like for you to look at other options or I'm experiencing microaggressions, right? He, he can't, doesn't have that language, but what he does know how to say is I don't want to go to school because my stomach hurts or because right. I have a headache. And he may actually, his stomach is probably hurting. He probably does have a headache because his body is having a physiological, a physical response to environment that's unsafe and unwell. And that's, that's called academic disidentification, mm -hmm. right? Academic disidentification. The body needs to feel safe in order to learn, right? So if that child, black girl, black boy, brown girl, brown boy, is on their way to school and their first period teacher is someone who doesn't give them, provide them a sense of belonging, their stress levels start to go up. So they start to underperform in that classroom, disengage, disassociate, right? And they don't, have the skills for um, self-regulation because most of us don't. We haven't learned how to self-regulate. So what happens is they're so highly straight, uh, stressed that they disengage because of the environment. They feel unsafe, unwanted. And then they'll go to their second period class. If that teacher is somebody who is um, engaging, warm, and centering the child, you'll see at the end of the first period that child's enthusiasm starts to go up, but it's not for that teacher or that classroom, it's for the next classroom. Mm -hmm. And it's high. So when those teachers talk, well, little Johnny and little JD is horrible in my class. Well, they're doing really well in mine. It's like two different people. One provides a safe um, climate, atmosphere, and the other one, um, is a dangerous one. So if you have a, if you're teaching young children and you find that they, that a child is not acting in the same way in your classroom as they're acting in others, instead of blaming the child, you might want to first look into the mirror and see if you're doing something that's contributing to it. Exactly. That's the point. And that's, is, and it's violence there too, because for many of those children, by the time they get to fifth grade, they'll start to academically disidentify, even when they have a high skill set, right? They just, and so if I just tune out, I just want to get through this with as least pain as possible. Yeah. So there's a few questions in here about at what point is it best to, to essentially move on to a different organization? Like at what point do you do you have to make that determination that because of the battle fatigue that is accumulating in your environment and the experiences that you're having that it's not worth it that you need to, to move on? Do you think that it gets to that point or is it, or 
Yeah. Do you think it can get to that point? Yeah. Well, racial bottom fatigue basically is an exhaustion of your ability to cope and survive in any situation, right? So it's exhausting your coping skills. So you've used everything possible to try to have homeostasis. And when you're off balance, psychologically, emotionally, behaviorally, um, physiologically, then that's the clue that you might want to think about going somewhere else. When you start to get rashes or your hair starts falling out or you start to have kind of um, digestive problems, uh, IBS, uh, if you start to increase smoking, uh, if you start um, having a, a change in your relationship with people who are really close to you, who you love, you just don't want to be around, you start to distance yourself. Those are indicators that you might be suffering from racial battle fatigue, or that's just the emotional behavior ones. Like you said earlier, the headaches, the grinding of the teeth, the clenched jaws, the chest pains, heart problems, indigestion, um, type two diabetes. It's not just always from poor eating and lack of exercise. It can be the stress of racism that instigates type two diabetes. Mm. So one of the questions that came in on YouTube talks about um, some of the blurring of lines that's happened because of uh, people having access to more virtual work. I mean, I know that many institutions, organizations aren't fully virtual, but there has been more of a move to create more kind of hybridized opportunities, which can blur the line between home and work and make that separation harder. Do you think that that, that blurring of lines can contribute to uh, one, racial bowel fatigue, but then to your home not being as safe as a, as a haven as it needs to be for you to recuperate? Yeah, we kind of found a, um, a bipolar outcome to the pandemic. For many um, African-Americans, Latinx, Asian-Americans, they said it's a relief not to go into work. It is, feels much better to work from home and not be around that kind of environment where they are constantly race lighted, right? And then after a while, it depends on the economic uh, um, standing of the person. So if they don't have a place uh, that's quiet and that, where they can be productive, if they have to, can't afford, um, or now you're with, at the beginning, you couldn't have your child in daycare. You might have had to homeschool. That's a, a stressor. So it's really a double-edged sword. Many people saw some relief initially, then they saw heightened stress because of the economic and social standings. Yeah, no, that, make, that makes a lot of sense. The um, part of, of what I, you know, I think really needs to happen is that those who are educators, whether they are in a school, a college, or a university, they should be learning about this before they go into a classroom. Um, because, because if they don't realize that it may be racial battle fatigue, they may revert back to the kind of common assumptions that there's something wrong with this child that they come from a bad community, bad school, all the deficit perspectives that blame students, blame their families and blame their communities rather than acknowledging the environments uh, that they're in. So I know that, and this was a, another question that came onto YouTube. So a lot of uh, attention has been placed on teachers being trauma informed. Does that look different than it means to be racial battle fatigue informed for these educators? Well, um... I think some of it is consistent mm -hmm. with what I'm saying. So the trauma, you know, what I what I do is say, you need to have um, trauma informed care, right? And so that trauma informed care is that recognition of what people might be going through to see those things show up in them. So some of those outcome um, things that I already explained. If you start to see a trend, you should maybe go there first and say, 
um, maybe this student needs help, right? Maybe they need to see the school um, counselor and not make it about their inability, that they have some type of deficit, right? Cognitive uh, deficit. Although stress can impact your academic performance. If you are stressed socially and economically, and then you're also stressed through um, the system of racism, how can you do perform up to your best? You can't do that as a professor. Right? Yeah, you yeah, can't. to get out pieces, right? So here's what I say. For those people who want to become a battle buddy, you have to have awareness. That means that you have to have a new lens of society and say, this is what's happening. Then you have to have acceptance, assurance, which is commitment, and then action to make a change. You can't jump from awareness, see this one um, race lighting episode, and say, oh, I'm going into action. No, you need to build your resume. Yeah. And part of building that resume means you should go out and read every single thing that has been written by <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Smith. I know that uh, I've, I've taken considerable time to do so, and I learn again uh, something new each time I hear you speak, and each time I read something that that you've written, uh, because there's so many different implications uh, for this, especially given that it spans uh, cognitive, uh, psychological, and physiological domains. So, any last words, Doctor Smith, that you'd like to share with 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 folks today? Any last thoughts? Well, last words. I really appreciate what you and Dr. Harris are doing. You're making a tremendous impact on our society. And you too are some of the significant critical leaders, um, not just in education, but you are cutting across all type of areas. And this is important. And the work that you're doing um, should be recognized and honored. So much so that Dr. Larry Parker and I are have a, a special issue um, call called you can't race like you can't race like critical race theory and that's really as an honor to the work that you all have done so it's a call for papers um, I gave it to Dr. Harris to send out so if there's anybody in this group that wants to submit an article please do that well thank you that's very kind of you we really appreciate the support and um and uh, thank you for helping us to, to have a, a conversation both on race lighting and racial battle fatigue. Thank you for the work that you're doing and for just illuminating for people and giving them the language to describe what uh, up till now has been very indescribable for many of us. So uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you. Okay, everyone, well, hopefully, uh, you, I, well, I should say hopefully, I know you all enjoyed it. <laughs> I know that I did uh, have an opportunity to hear from Dr. Smith. Next week, we'll be back for the last uh, session of this series. Um, and we have some more surprises in store for you then. And we will see you then. Uh, again, go to racelighting.net if you want to learn more about race lighting, or go to corelearning.org to uh, access the two CEU uh, program for free. Thank you to the College Futures Foundation for their uh, relentless support of the work and have a good rest of your day.